Good afternoon. Welcome back to the County Council. We are now going to present a proclamation recognizing uh, the holy month of Ramadan, and that will be presented uh, by me and the County Executive, and I invite all of my colleagues to join us as well. So, and come on, everyone who's here too, please join us. Slide on in, come on. <laughs> we are all friends, yes. On. Slide on in. We have more room over here as well. There we go. Fantastic. Well, I am so delighted that we are all here this afternoon to uh, recognize the holy month of Ramadan and to celebrate all of our um, Muslim American neighbors and friends here in Montgomery County. We are one of the most diverse places in this entire country. And that is why I, I wanted to make sure that all of my colleagues, the full council and the county executive uh, are here for this proclamation signifying Montgomery County's true commitment, friendship, and fellowship with all of our Muslim neighbors as you are about to uh, uh, follow the rituals of this holy month uh, uh, and fasting and meditating and providing charity and continuing to love. And that's really what we are all here about, helping, loving, uniting, and celebrating. And so I just want to say thank you for everything that each and every one of you do, the health clinics that you provide, the other support services that the community uh, expresses and provides to all the communities throughout Montgomery County. Uh, we are true partners in this work. And so from the bottom of my heart, thank you. And County Executive. Assalamu alaikum. I just, uh, first of all, just take a moment in remembrance of Dr. Rahman and Tufel Ahmad, who's played an amazing role in this community. And we lost them over the last year or so, and I just wanted to acknowledge all the loss in the community. Um, but this is also a day of celebration, and you know, those are two people who helped, I think, bring us to the point that we're at today. Uh, the Muslim community in Montgomery County plays an important role. It's present in pretty much every aspect of Montgomery County life. Uh, and you partner with an amazing group of people. And I always remind people of the Muslim clinics, which serve more non-Muslims than they serve Muslims in Montgomery County. Your commitment to the brotherhood and sisterhood of all of us is really important. And we really do welcome your presence. Um, it's good to have you as partners. I see many people in the medical professions and the science professions especially, and it's you know worth acknowledging the role you play in some of the leading um, industries in, in Montgomery County, as well as presence in education world. So thank you very much. I look forward to working with you. Thank you for everything you did during the height of COVID. You contributed to so many clinics, so many feeding efforts, so many things we needed to do in the community to keep us safe and you were a part of that. So I want to thank you for everything you did to help make those things possible and get us through the worst of COVID. And it's a testimony to your commitment to everyone in Montgomery County. And I think it's reflected in the commitment of everybody here in the county government, everybody on the county council to working with this community to build a stronger county for all of us. So thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, first, I would like to, uh, before I say something about Ramadan, to thank our county executive, Mark, and the county council. And it's my honor to be with you today, and we really appreciate it, uh, organizing this event in terms of about Ramadan. And Ramadan is the time that the, the entire Muslim world we are participating in fasting in the month of Ramadan, and the purpose of Ramadan is to gain 
to be close to God. So Ramadan is time when the family and the loved one get together, break their fast. It is not Ramadan, it is not only to refrain food and drink and relationships, but also it's a time to evaluate our life. To re-evaluate our life, Ramadan, it teaches us patience. We are not only avoid food and drink, we also avoid idle talk, gossiping, backbiting. So it's time that we also avoid wastefulness. It's time to also reach out those who are less fortunate. So when you are fasting and stay away, even though you are able to eat food, then you remember those who are less fortunate, who doesn't have. That's why most of the Muslim community around the globe in the month of Ramadan, that's the time they give their zakat. Zakat is a two and a half percent, your wealth, your growth in the year. So it's a time that the Muslim community and other fellow human they enjoy. So there's some lessons we learned from Ramadan. I will mention maybe three of them. One is uh, discipline. Because you, the food in front of you, you avoid it. It's a time also we evaluate our whole body holistically to learn and get close to God. It is a time also to be grateful. When you break in your fast, you are thirst, you are hungry, you feel the blessing that God gives you. So you are grateful. It is a time also you feel the pain and the suffer that those who are less fortunate going through and then you donate your money. You give charity. It is a time that the family come together. Throughout the year, you know, we go to work, we are busy, our daily routines, but when Ramadan come, we come together, we bring our fast, there's a whole family reunited. And finally, it's a time management also. Actually, it's the best time to take care of your time. Anyway, I wish for you happy Ramadan, my Muslim brothers and my fellow brothers and sisters. We will invite you in our places in the month of Ramadan. May the peace and blessing of God be upon you all. Thank you. Ramadan Mubarak, thank you. Oh, county Executive, you want to join me? Yep. Uh, the Montgomery County, uh, uh, the Council of Montgomery County, Maryland Proclamation, whereas Montgomery County takes great pride in being a community of people from diverse cultures, ethnicities, and religions, including the Muslim American community, and? Whereas Muslims have made far-reaching contributions to the modern world, and are known as founders of the of operative surgery, the first university, the first hospital, and have made great strides in spreading other cultures throughout the world. And whereas the Muslim community has contributed to the local economic development, expansion of businesses, education, workforce training, health care, public safety, and housing in Montgomery County, and whereas Montgomery County residents, employers, and employees can benefit tremendously from better understanding how Muslim Americans are an integral part of our community and whereas Islam is a religion of peace and the Ramadan month of fasting, prayer, and charity is observed by Muslims around the world, including in Montgomery County, Maryland. Now therefore be it resolved that County Executive Mark Elrich, Council President Class, and the entire County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland hereby proclaim March 22nd through April 20th, 2023 as the holy month of Ramadan in Montgomery County. We encourage our residents, employers, and employees to join us in recognizing the contributions of the Muslim community and to participate in celebrations during this month, signed on this day by County Executive and myself. Congratulations.
It's a partnership. Thank you, everybody, for that wonderful proclamation and celebration of our community and anticipation for the holy month of Ramadan and look forward to seeing so many of you at the iftars that are to come. Um, so colleagues, we're going to move on with our agenda. First up is item number six, a public hearing on Bill 1123, motor vehicles and traffic, traffic control signals, devices, and Enforcement Action Plan, also known as the Safe Streets Act of 2023. This bill would require an infrastructure review for pedestrian-related collisions within a, count, within a county's school zone, prohibit a driver of a motor vehicle from making a right turn on red at certain intersections, require certain traffic control devices at crosswalks in the county's downtown and town center areas, require the county executive to provide an automated traffic enforcement plan and generally amend the law regarding motor vehicles and traffic control. A Transportation and Environment Committee work session is scheduled for March 30th. Those wishing to submit testimony for the council's consideration must do so before the close of business on March 23rd. We have 11 speakers joining us. Nine are in person and two are virtual. So I'm going to call up uh, the first four who are here, uh, Mr. Wade Holland, um, Eli Glazer, Seth Grimes, and Timothy Ernst. Thank you all. Mr. Holland, we'll begin with you. You have three minutes. All right, thank you so much. Thank you to Council President Glass, Council Vice President Fries, and all the members of the County Council. My name is Wade Holland. I'm a Vision Zero Coordinator for Montgomery County Government, and I'm here today on behalf of the County Executive to testify in support of Bill 11-23. Bill 11-23 takes steps to improve pedestrian safety in our downtown and town center areas by expanding no turn on red restrictions, as well as implementing lead pedestrian intervals at signalized intersections. The bill also requires crash reviews in school zones and publishing an automated enforcement plan. The county executive supports the intent of all four of these initiatives as each is an element of our existing Vision Zero 2030 action plan. Executive agency staff looks forward to working with the council on amendments to enhance the effectiveness of this legislation by requiring development of an implementation plan for no turn on red restrictions and lead pedestrian intervals, encouraging more uniform implementation across county and state locations, and providing a waiver requirements at locations where it is determined that the implementation would be counterproductive or alternative treatments may be a better fit for the context on the roadway. The automated enforcement plan should reflect automated enforcement technologies that are currently approved by the state and the county for use. Currently, stop sign monitoring systems are not permitted in the state of Maryland, and unfortunately, enabling legislation is unlikely to pass this legislative uh, year. The county executive thanks the council for considering measures to improve roadway safety and advance Vision Zero on county roads through measures like those recommended in Bill 11-23. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Glazer. Uh, council President Glass and members of county council, my name is Eli Glazer and I'm a transportation planner with Montgomery Planning. I'm also the project manager for the county's pedestrian master plan. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today about Bill 11-23. Uh, we believe the proposed legislation is a fantastic step towards achieving the county's Vision Zero goals and creating a county where pedestrians are prioritized and walking and rolling is how people want to get around. Several elements in the legislation, particularly those related to no turn on red, leading pedestrian intervals and automated enforcement, strongly echo key actions in the draft pedestrian master plan. I think it's really wonderful to see those elements moving forward even before the plan is adopted. I wanted to briefly highlight the Planning Board's comments on this legislation, which they transmitted earlier this week. First, uh, the Board noted that the scope of the traffic infrastructure review effort could be expanded. The idea that reviewing non-student pedestrian crashes in school zones would also be beneficial because the changes made in response to those crashes would likely prevent future crashes that may involve students. 
Second, um, while no turn on red and leading pedestrian intervals have proven traffic safety benefits, they may not be the most appropriate solution at every intersection. The board noted that no turn on red and leading pedestrian intervals should be the default approach, but that MCDOT should have discretion in their implementation so that if no turn on red and leading pedestrian intervals are not implemented, a rationale for that decision should be shared publicly. Third, the, lo the legislation references county roads and intersections of a county road. The legislation should be clarified to refer to county controlled signalized intersections because these are the locations where no turn on red and leading pedestrian interval are possible and where the county has jurisdiction. Uh, and then fourth, um, sort of building on Mr. Holland's comments, uh, a working group could be convened to include MCDOT and State Highway Administration to explore opportunities for imp implementing similar no turn on red restrictions and leading pedestrian interval at the state controlled signalized intersections in downtowns and town centers. And then lastly, uh, the board recommended that the leading pedestrian interval requirements should apply to the intersections within one block of schools, parks, rail and rapid bus rapid transit stations and community centers outside of the downtowns and town centers because these are also areas of high pedestrian activity. Uh, the board's transmittal also includes specific modifications to the bill text to incorporate these comments. Um, I really wanted to thank you again for the opportunity to share the planning board's comments on this legislation. The board and planning department staff look forward to discussing uh, the additional efforts to implement the pedestrian master plan recommendations. And then um, for those interested in pedestrian issues listening here at home, I would encourage you to submit testimony on the pedestrian master plans public hearing on March 23rd by going to the Montgomery Planning Board website. Thank you. I thank the planning board for those thoughtful comments. Uh, Mr. Grimes, thank you, turn on your microphone. Thank you, Council President Glass. Council members, the Washington Area Bicyclist Association supports Bill 1123, the Safe Streets Act of 2023. WABA is a nonprofit with 1,300 Maryland members. I am Maryland organizer. We envision a just and sustainable transportation system where walking, biking, and transit are the best ways to get around. The, States, the Safe Streets Act advances Montgomery County toward meeting our Vision Zero commitment. We appreciate the requirement that the county executive provide an automated enforcement plan. The county's Office of Legislative Oversight has found severe racial disparities in police traffic enforcement. Uh, automated enforcement is far less discriminatory than police traffic stops. We recommend a modification to the act that the traffic infrastructure review provision cover all students going to or from school in Montgomery County, regardless of time, distance from school, mode, or road jurisdiction, as well as all collisions of any sort with a person in an established county school zone for Mr. Glazer or on school property during arrival or dismissal. And please consider extending the act to suburban areas and reducing permissive left turns, a point recommended by the county's draft pedestrian master plan. We look forward to working with you on steps beyond this act. Which steps? The county should encourage Montgomery County municipalities to adopt Safe Streets Act provisions themselves, covering their own downtown and town center areas, possibly their suburban areas. And beyond the Safe Streets Act, Montgomery County should systematically lower speed limits countywide on arterials and in downtown and town center areas, and specifically to 20 miles per hour on residential streets. Compare that effective July 1, 2020, the District of Columbia established a default speed limit of 20 miles per hour for all local streets, residential streets that primarily serve neighborhood traffic. According to the Federal Highway Administration, a driver, quoting, a driver traveling at 30 miles per hour who hits a pedestrian has a 45% chance of killing or seriously injuring them. At 20 miles per hour, that percentage drops to 5%. Similar fatality and serious injury stats apply for bicyclists struck by a driver traveling at higher versus lower speeds. Maryland Transportation Code allows alteration of maximum speed limits but requires an engineering or traffic investigation for streets whose limit is to be lowered. The county should request a 2024 state bill to allow speed limit reduction for an entire jurisdiction or area following creation of a jurisdiction or area-wide complete streets plan. Then the county should pursue reduction to 20 miles per hour on residential streets rather that systematically rather than the project-based reduction seen in the county's complete streets guide. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. The Washington Area Bicyclist Association supports the act before us today. We thank Councilmember Glass for introducing this bill and the nine co-sponsors. 
Thank you, Mr. Grimes. Mr. Ernst. Yep, turn your microphone on. There you go. Thank you, Council Member Glass and members of the committee. My name is Timothy Ernst. I am here to support Bill 1123, Safe Streets Act. I've been riding my bicycle around Montgomery County, D.C., and PG County for 25 years. Uh, my family lives near Georgia Avenue, <clears throat> statistically the most dangerous road in Montgomery County. Here's a partial list of pedestrians killed on Georgia Avenue. <clears throat> 49-year-old Ra Ramon Sanchez killed August 11, 2018 by a car while trying to cross Georgia at Veers Mill Road. Nine days later, 56-year-old Alberto Hilario killed by a vehicle while crossing Georgia Avenue at Glen Allen Avenue. Four days after that, 56, I'm sorry, 41-year-old Maurizio Carrera killed at Georgia Avenue and Reedy Drive near Wheaton Metro. In April 2021, Claire Grossman was killed by a Toyota Camry while crossing Georgia Avenue near Rippling Brook Drive. Mrs. Grossman, age 65, did not own a car. She relied on public transportation and had to cross six lanes of traffic to get to her bus stop. Five years earlier, Mrs. Grossman's husband, Robert Grossman, was killed by an automobile while he was crossing Georgia Avenue. 1,000 feet away from the spot his wife was killed. April 2022, one year ago, Eric Grossi, age 74, died after being hit by a Subaru Forester while he was in a crosswalk. He was in a crosswalk on Tuckerman Lane in North Bethesda. Rick was my cousin. Three years earlier, in 2019, Jennifer DeMauro, age 31, was killed while walking in the same crosswalk on Tuckerman Lane. We can prevent pedestrian and bicycle deaths if we redesign streets and enforce speed limits and lower speed limits. We can be inspired by cities like Barcelona, Bogota, New York, Buenos Aires, Rotterdam, and London, where government agencies and citizens together are taking action to save lives. I'm sending the committee, the Transportation and Environment Committee, a copy of Best Practice in Urban Road Safety, published by the International Transport Forum. These case studies illustrate other cities' experiences of developing reliable traffic injury data with hospitals and police departments, enforcing speed limits, implementing safer street design, and predicting and preventing road crashes. It's my fervent hope that Montgomery County, DOT, Maryland, SHA, and law enforcement will use these case studies as a resource and will encourage staff to attend webinars by the International Transport Forum to learn best practices. Thank you for listening. I support this legislation. I hope we can all together begin to create change. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Ernest, for that testimony and for uh, reminding us of who's passed so that we can work to prevent future deaths. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your testimony. Next, I'd like to invite up Bridget Howe, Miriam Schoenbaum, Carolyn Wilson, and Mindy Baden. Ms. Howe, we'll begin with you. You have three minutes. Uh, good afternoon, Council President Glass and Council Members. I'm testifying to support the Safe Streets Act of 2023, although I would like to suggest some amendments to specifically target safety for those who are most vulnerable on roads, which is our children. The Safe Streets Act is an important step to continue to meet our Vision Zero goal and commitment. While some progress has been made with bike lanes, road diets, reduced speed limits, and other enforcement actions in the last few years, we need more action to prevent additional deaths and serious injuries from avoidable collisions. As I said, I support this act, but I want to specifically discuss needed amendments. In addition to road safety, my other advocacy passion is ensuring that Montgomery County schools are safe, welcoming, and encourage success for all students. This can't begin to be realized when our students can't even get to school without fearing for their safety on our roads. 
I want to share a personal example. My son is a sixth grader at Odessa Shannon Middle School. He is a bus rider, um, a hazard bus rider, because we are within the walk zone. Uh, but some days he oversleeps and I drive him in. And when I do, sometimes he asks to be dropped off on the street so that he can walk in versus being dropped off in the loop. I've let him do it a couple of times, but I can't let him do it again. It's too, it's too unsafe to cross at a marked crosswalk on a neighborhood road. Um, it, driver behavior, road design, the way that the school itself is set up, it's too, too unsafe. I track incidents involving students and youth, and in January we had a significant number of students, more than six, who were on their way to or from school when they were struck by drivers. Luckily, no fatalities. Um, to decrease those numbers, I do ask for a modification to the act that would allow the traffic infrastructure review provision to cover all students going to and from school in Montgomery County, regardless of what time of day, the distance from the school, the mode of transportation, or the jurisdictional owner of the road. Thinking about, for example, the students from Kennedy High School who were hit uh, while waiting on Georgia Avenue in Aspen Hill. The act is currently, currently written wouldn't require infrastructure reviews for many of the deadlier serious crashes that have happened within the last few years. Another example, a young girl, Newport Mill, Newport Mill Middle School student, whose leg was broken when she was hit by a car on her bicycle on her way to school. Uh, as my personal example showed, arrival and dismissal are dangerous times for students in neighborhoods. And therefore, another amendment would be that all collisions with any driver, regardless of whether they're transporting a student, during arrival or dismissal in a school zone or on school property should also be part of that review. Also, uh, while I know you don't have jurisdiction over school construction, it is CIP time. We should not be building schools that do not prioritize pedestrian uh, pedestrian transit and bike access. The fact that we do is a shame, and the county planning and MCPS and the state need to work together to change this. Um, I do look forward to this bill's enactment and implementation and to working with you on future solutions. Thank you for allowing me to testify. Thank you. Ms. Schoenbaum. I'm Miriam Schoenbaum. I'm here on behalf of the Action Committee for Transit, and we support safe routes to school. We support them at Newport Mill, we support them at Watkins Mill, at Bradley Hills and Seneca Valley, Walter Johnson, Gaithersburg Kennedy, Springbrook Sherwood and RM, Walters Waters Landing and Loiterman, Magruder, Halley Wells, Northwest Frost, Clemente, Banneker, Julius West, Montgomery Village and Poolsville and Wheaton, Crest Haven, BCC, Paint Branch and Wooten. All these schools recently had students hit. Safe routes to school? No, not a bit. We support safe routes in the mornings, at midday, afternoons, and in the evenings, on sidewalks, in crossings, and at school bus stops, in parking lots, driveways, and parent car loops, on foot, in a wheelchair, or with a bicycle, on a scooter, or skateboard, or a unicycle, on a school bus, or public bus, or in a car, in a school zone, or near school, or when school is far in East County, West County, Up County, Down, on state roads and county and city and town, the council has the authority to require review by MCDOT. Our kids should have safe routes to school. Please you support safe routes to school. Please you support them here and there. Please you support them everywhere. Switching from poetry to prose in case it wasn't clear, we support safe routes to school, but the scope of the bill must be expanded to include all students going to or from school on all roads, including state roads, at all times in all modes of transportation, as well as all crashes on school property or in a school zone, not just some, all. And we also support the other provisions of this bill, including leading pedestrian intervals and right, no right turn on red, and we've submitted written, written testimony that you can refer to. Thank you, Ms. Schoenbaum, and let me know if you need a publisher for that uh, <laughs> Seuss-inspired, spot-on testimony. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Wilson. Okay, unfortunately, I'm not going to be nearly as entertaining, <laughs> um, but it is a serious topic nonetheless. Um, good afternoon. I'm here to present testimony on behalf of the Montgomery County Chapter of the Organization Families for Safe Streets. Our organization is working to provide support and share community for families and friends of trash traffic crash victims to help share stories of the lives of those lost and preventable 
traffic crashes and to convert those stories into effective advocacy in Montgomery County and the state of Maryland in order to prompt changes that would prevent such tragedies from occurring in the future. Unfortunately, all of those um, examples cited by Mr. Ernst and more are very familiar to our organization. We're the ones who post ghost shoes, ghost bikes, and do those memorials in um, honor of those who've lost their lives to traffic violence. So first, I want to clearly and unequivocally express our full support for the automated traffic enforcement plan and the leading pedestrian intervals and no turn on red provisions. I don't have time here to fully articulate our reasons, but I have provided this in written testimony. Regarding the Safe Streets Act, um, we do um, also want to have an expanded scope of the Safe Routes to School provision. To be clear, we strongly support the Safe Routes to School as it is critical, but it doesn't go far enough. The reality is that many school-related crashes happen outside the current scope, and just looking at crashes involving students in schools that happened in January, for example, eight out of nine of those crashes would have been outside of the scope of the law as currently written. So as others have already stated, we would request that the scope be widened to include all roads, all times for crashes in school zones or on school property involving students going to school from school before, during, and after arrival and dismissal times. And our reasons for these proposed amendments are threefold. First, within the narrow scope of the language, every time a school-related crash happens, it will require determining if it's in or out of scope. Secondly, the MCDOT um, claims has authority over county roads, but in our view, there are no restrictions from the county conducting an infrastructure review on state and municipal roads and providing input on such roads. Um, while MCDOT has countered there are insufficient resources to conduct infrastructure reviews for all school-related crashes, we argue this is the very reason for why these need to be included. What higher priority does the county have than the safety of our children going to and from their schools? In summary, we strongly support the Safe Streets Act of 2023 with such amendments to expand the scope of the Safe Routes to School provision to include all school-related crashes. Thank you for providing Providing me the opportunity to testify today on behalf of the Montgomery County Chapter of Families for Safe Streets. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Uh, and Ms. Baden. Good afternoon. I'd like to thank Council President Glass, County Council members, and all the concerned citizens that are here today. My name is Mindy Baden. I'm here to talk the imp about the importance of Bill 11 23, the Safe Streets Act of 2023. Over the past years, there have been too many crashes involving pedestrians and bicyclists on our Montgomery County roadways. In early 2020, my family suffered the loss of my 32-year-old son, Brett, as he was crossing Rockville Pike to meet some friends for dinner. Montgomery County lost a gentle, sweet soul that day. He was an exemplary citizen who was a role model to his peers. Brett lived an honest and productive life and his future was taken from him on the streets of Montgomery County. My future has been dealt a blow from which I will never recover. My family is not the only one that has suffered a loss. Just turn on the local news on any given night and chances are there's a report of another roadway fatality in our area. And there are many instances of fatalities occurring within hours of each other. My son Brett was the second pedestrian killed on Rockville Pike in a 24-hour period. Council President Glass has introduced Bill 11-23, the Safe Streets Act of 2023. Aligned with the goals of Vision Zero, it contains some common sense measures to improve safety on our county roads and prevent pedestrian and bicyclist crashes. I wholeheartedly support it, and I also agree with Eli Glazier and the Montgomery County Planning Board that the no turn on red and the LPI provisions also be included in areas with large pedestrian traffic, such as near parks, community centers, schools, and transportation centers. And also this legislation pertains only to county roads. At first I was excited that the main intersection where I live in Olney would have some of these traffic devices. And then I realized that our main intersection in Olney has two state roadways. 
In fact, most of the heavily trafficked urban roads with large amounts of pedestrian traffic are state roads. There will be no immediate improvements resulting from this bill to many of those intersections within our county. We need to not only pass this bill for our county roads, but also make sure that our state legislators understand that passing a version of this bill for our state roads is imperative to the safety of our pedestrians, our bicyclists, our rollers, and our motorists. Thank you. Mindy, thank you for being here. Thank you for turning your incredibly tragic situation into activism so that what happened to Brett does not happen to anybody else. And I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Council Member Fani Gonzalez has something to say. Um, thank you for being here. Very quickly, um, because Ms. Bridget mentioned it, um, one of the biggest frustrations that I have had, especially coming from parking planning, is that every time MCPS goes to the planning board with a mandatory referral, meaning uh, they come in with, you know, with a proposal for a new building, the decisions that the planning board make, they're non-binding, meaning that it's just a recommendation that we give to MCPS. So Odessa Shannon, my daughter's going there next year, by the way. Odessa Shannon Middle School, Northwood, I mean, there's so many schools in the county where they have refused to move the building up to the street. Creating, putting parking, lot, parking lots in front of the school is anti-pedestrian, is anti-business, is anti-everything. They still don't get it yet. They expect to have half of the budget and continue doing what they're doing, and it's not okay. There has to be some legal remedy because honestly, seven years on the planning board, meeting with um, school board members, senior staff, it's like talking to a wall. It's talking to a wall. So I'm looking at you, or legal staff. We're gonna have to sit down and you're gonna have to tell me how we can make them do the right thing because they're not gonna do it by themselves. It's just like, I give up. And you just brought it up again. And it's a brand new school, Odessa Shannon, huge. You gotta walk like five minutes from the street to get to the entrance because they built it all the way up there. So I'm with you, so more to come. And then the second thing very quickly, um, on Georgia Avenue, I uh, thank you so much for highlighting that. Uh, thank you to my colleagues here on TE and and the entire council. We placed Georgia Avenue as part of the priority letter for the transportation priorities. I made the request and they'll say yes without questioning. And, um, and uh, yesterday actually I touched base with somebody very close to the governor. And uh, again, he is hopefully by June, he's gonna be coming to Wheaton and walking the street people in leadership, they need to walk on the street to really understand what we're talking about and see how dangerous it is. So stay tuned on that one. So that's it, thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Ludke. I just wanna thank you all for your testimony and for your ongoing support for these initiatives. And um, you know, when we talked last week, I thought it would be a no brainer for that increased speed limit for speed cameras bill to, to go through in the state. I didn't think we'd be here after crossover saying it didn't, it didn't make it because that seemed like low hanging fruit to help solve a substantial problem. Um, and specifically because there are so many roads in our district that have that exact requirement. So you hear something policy wise and you think it's gonna be a great idea and then you realize that's not within our control locally to fix unless there's a, a change made at the state level. So I um, you know, I, I truly stand behind wanting to continue to support that effort to move that forward. And you know, Maryland, Maryland is one of the few states in the country that is a contributory negligent, no, I did have coffee, contributory negligence state as opposed to comparative negligence state. And we're not here to debate the, the relevant merits of, of one system over the other in our, in our tort law. But what we can do as policymakers is to say, well, if we see observable things happening in a particular place, and even if a pedestrian is moving in a way they shouldn't be moving, if if we know there's a known thing that creates the problem that makes them go across the road at a place where they shouldn't be crossing the road, we should do something to help fix that, um, whether it's increased lighting or or other things that we can do that to help mitigate that risk, right? Some people will still make that choice and, and 
that's beyond the scope, but we can still do things to make that better and improve that. So thank you all for, for your testimony, and I think this is one step in the right direction. We are not done yet. We still have two more people who are waiting to testify, and they've been texting me to make sure we did not forget about them. Thank, so th thank you all for being present today uh, and testifying. There are two more people uh, who are virtual. Uh, first is Allison Gillespie. Hello. I'm so glad everything gets forgotten. Um, I am here very much to express my support for Bill 1123. I'm a former Civic Association president in a neighborhood right next to Forest Glen Metro and along Georgia Avenue. And I also helped to start MCC PTA Safe Routes to School Committee a few years ago. The problem of road safety is very big, and I salute Councilmember Glass for leading the council in trying to solve it. Um, but here are my quick thoughts. It is a very good idea to prioritize pedestrians in our crosswalks. And my experience is that our walk times across this county are ridiculously short, given how urban we are. Um, we've been arguing in our neighborhood for years to get one or two seconds, one or two freaking seconds added to cross Georgia Avenue. And um, we argue and argue like we're negotiating the biggest contract ever. Um, and it doesn't help. It's fine if we're thinking about even for me, it's hard to cross the street, but we shouldn't be basing those times on someone like me. We should be thinking about someone with a stroller, a pregnant woman, an elderly man with a cane, or a family holding hands who are trying to cross safely, because crossing a street should not be an athletic event, crossing to a bus or metro especially. I also strongly support the recommendation for the staff at the planning board to expand the implementation of lead pedestrian intervals to areas outside of downtown. Some of our worst areas are in the up county near Seneca uh, High School, it's a nightmare. Um, there's lots of places way outside our downtowns where we need to be looking at that. So town centers, we should include schools, parks, and community centers. Um, I'm really pleased we're trying to get rid of right on red, and I, I echo the thoughts of others that have said that, but um, I also think it should not just be at busy downtown intersections, and it's not gonna work unless we do, as the planning board recommends, and work with MCDOT and SHA to explore how we can get rid of them because the worst ones are on state controlled roads like Georgia, University, Beers Mill, on and on and on. And it doesn't really mean anything unless we conquer those. Um, I'm also very much in favor of automated traffic enforcement. Um, and for all the reasons that Seth Grimes outlined, I echo all of those. It is way past time for our county executive to get on board with this and do something about pedestrian safety. And so I think having him, holding him accountable is great. Frankly, his lack of attention to this problem is disgusting and inexcusable. And without better automated enforcement, nothing else in this bill will be effective at all. So let's give it some teeth. Um, during my short tenure on the Safe Routes to School Committee, a shocking number of children were injured or killed. Killed. Children were killed. And I wasn't even that, on that committee that long. It, it was crazy. Um, and we need to review the infrastructure. So that's really essential. But frankly, uh, I don't think we're going far enough, as others have said. We need to look at the time traveling to from school, those who are walking, those who are walking to bus stops. It's not just about what's happening near school buildings. Thanks so much. Thanks again for taking the time to take care of this problem. Thank you, Ms. Gillespie. And the final speaker on this item will be Jamie Hare. Good afternoon, and thank you, Montgomery County Council, for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Jamie Herr, and I live at 11401 Kenton Drive in Wheaton. I'm a passionate Wheaton advocate and a Montgomery County advocate. My husband and I have been residents of Montgomery County for 12 years. We bought a house here. We started a family here. We are invested in this community. My background is in urban planning, so apologize for being a nerd, um, but I currently work in this field for the federal government. I wanted to start by saying that I applaud the county for consideration of this bill. It is long overdue. The state of street and roadway design and safety in our county is really at a crossroads, pun intended. I support the proposed additions of an infrastructure review after any pedestrian related collisions, restricting right turns on red at certain intersections, requiring traffic control devices at crosswalks and other elements in the bill. However, the bill's biggest problem is that it does not and cannot go far enough under the current roadway governance structure in the county. Unfortunately, the safety of the county's roads are not in our hands, not in the hands of those most familiar with our local issues or the most invested in our success. The county has a strong progressive platform of street and pedestrian safety, but lacks the authority to implement it on the roads that matter most, roads managed by the State Highway Administration. If the county council seriously wants to improve pedestrian and driver safety throughout the county, 
it is imperative that you take over ownership and management of all roads controlled by State Highway Administration in urbanized areas. This is already a recommendation in the draft pedestrian master plan and I support it. The SHA design guidelines and safety procedures are outdated and unresponsive to the rapidly growing urban context of this county. They are not capable of meeting the needs of our county and residents and people are dying because of it. We must do better. In summary, I strongly support the Safe Streets Act of 2023, but just as strongly encourage the county to take the next steps to protect all roads, all road users, all pedestrian crossings, all intersections. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hare. Uh, I want to th once again thank everybody for joining us this afternoon and testifying this piece of legislation and uh, reminding us of those we've lost so that we can make sure that we do not lose any more in the name of Vision Zero. And with that, this public hearing is now closed. Next is item number seven. This is a public hearing on an amendment to F the FY2328 Capital Improvements Program and a supplemental appropriation to the FY23 capital budget for the Montgomery County Public Schools, relocatable classrooms in the amount of $7,500,000. Action is scheduled immediately following this hearing, and there are no speakers for this hearing. This public hearing is now closed. Uh, is there a motion? Uh, moved by Council Member Albernaz, seconded by Council Member Juwando. All those in favor of this item, signify by raising your hand, and that is unanimous. Thank you. Item number eight, this is a public hearing on a supplemental appropriation to the FY23 capital budget for the Montgomery County Public Schools HVAC mechanical systems replacement in the amount of 25 million dollars. Action is scheduled immediately following this public hearing. There are no speakers for this public hearing and this public hearing is now closed. Can I get a motion? Moved by Councilmember Jawando. Second. Seconded by Councilmember Ludke. All those in favor? And that is unanimous. Uh, last uh, no, uh, item number nine. Uh, is action on amendments to the comprehensive water supply and sewer systems plan water and sewer category change requests. The T&E committee recommends approval. Uh, Mr. Levchenko, do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, the committee looked at um, seven category change requests that were transmitted by the county executive. All seven were in the Potomac subregion master plan area. Um, six were actually in the Glen Hills area, uh, which the uh, uh, previous councils have had a lot of experience with in terms of water and sewer issues. Um, and all of them involved the peripheral sewer service policy, which is unique to the Potomac subregion master plan area. So the committee uh, spent a fair amount of time as they went through each of these requests and uh, comparing that to the policy. Um, in um, uh, uh, all of the cases, there's a few that are, that are associated with the city of Rockville, I'll talk to in a minute, but uh, the ones where it was a, st a straightforward peripheral sewer service request within the water, um, within the um, Washington's Urban Sanitary District, uh, the executive, the planning uh, board, uh, council staff, and the committee uh, all felt that the requests did not meet the um, requirements or intent of the peripheral sewer policy. And so a number of these requests were denied based on that. There are also three requests uh, that uh, were um, seeking approval through the peripheral sewer service policy related to um, uh, their adjacency uh, to the Rockville uh, uh, service area, not specifically the Washington's Urban Sanitary uh, service area within the county. Um, so in those cases, the uh, uh, um, uh, we'd recommended deferral um, because we had a uh, uh, request before the well, a, a policy change within the um, uh, water and sewer plan from last year that was before the state, uh, the Maryland Department of the Environment, and uh, the um, policy change had been to affirm the council's position that the peripheral sewer service policy was intended to address. Um, periphery to our own water and sewer envelope and not the city of Rockville. 
Um, we actually did get a recent action from the state on that, uh, affirming that, uh, but it came too late for change in this packet. And we had some other issues we have to deal with with regard to the uh, uh, state's approval action. Uh, so we plan to bring that back to the council as a separate discussion uh, of all those pending issues. Uh, so the, the recommendations for those three related requests in here are still to defer, uh, although they, uh, they may well come back as noted in the packet as denials um, in the near future. Uh, but just to note that th that's pending. Um, there's also one request uh, that is actually in the Rockville service area now, uh, but not within the city of Rockville city limits. Uh, and in that case, uh, a deferral is also recommended uh, pending an annexation discussion uh, between the applicant and the city of Rockville and the county uh, to try to work that out. Um, so that request is also deferred. Uh, and staff would be happy to answer any specific questions regarding any of these uh, requests. We also have um, executive branch staff here and also uh, planning department staff available if there's any questions. Uh, thank you for that overview, Mr. Lubchenko. I'll say that the T&E committee had a, a, a deep dive into the sewer category changes, the first time that uh, this committee and this council uh, talked about the subject. Um, so there's a, there's a, a lot to learn, um, but I think, Mr. Lubchenko, you, you've brought us all up to speed. I don't see any questions from any colleagues, so if there's a motion to move this forward. Uh, moved by Council Member Balcom, seconded by Council Member Katz. All those in favor of the sewer category change requests? And that is unanimous. Thank you. Item number 10 on our agenda is an update on the American Rescue Plan Act and FEMA reimbursements. I see Mr. Howard is coming on down and members of the executive team. Uh, let, me, let me tee up the conversation by saying that as, as part of the FY21 and 22 budgets, um, the council and county executive engaged in um, uh, fiscal discussions about reimbursements for these federal funds uh, and how we would use them. Uh, recognizing that our goal was to keep our residents safe and healthy in an unprecedented global pandemic. Uh, and as the federal government signaled to us that the funding was winding down and would not be renewed, we looked at our, our, our future budgets and determined to determine um, future reimbursements and future expenditures. And so the reason we're having this conversation today is get an update on where we've been and how much we have left and uh, all the other fiscal questions that have arised from hundreds of millions of dollars in federal support during the pandemic. Uh, and so with that, uh, I will turn it over to Mr. Howard to start the conversation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And we structured the conversation to first talk about the FEMA reimbursement part, and then after that, we can talk about the uh, the status of, of the ARPA funding. Um, you mentioned the background of the of all these federal dollars that came into the um, into the county's budget, kind of for the first time during the pandemic. Uh, FEMA reimbursement is kind of entered our budget lexicon because of the pandemic. It obviously always existed, but was never a, a much of a factor in our budget discussions. Um, you know, so for the first time. As part of the FY21 and 22 budgets, the executive did include FEMA reimbursements as a budgeted resource um, based on the anticipated uh, expenditures we were going to get reimbursed by FEMA. Um, and so this, when the council approved the FY22 budget, it did include an assumption of receiving $83.7 million in FY21 and $23.9 million in FY22 in FEMA reimbursement. Uh, council and executive had several conversations about FEMA reimbursement, about several different issues. And then halfway through FY22, as part of the December uh, fiscal update, uh, because of the pace of reimbursements received to date, which the county had received about $36 million, um, the executive branch removed the FEMA reimbursements from the fiscal plan as a resource and instead only started counting the money that we had actually received. So no more assumptions about money coming in because it was not coming in at the pace anticipated um, and, and, and not using it as a resource as part of the budget deliberations. And so the FY23 budget approved by the council did not assume any FEMA resources um, you know, any revenues would be received from FEMA, and the council did include a provision in the budget resolution clarifying that any FEMA reimbursement received um, should be treated as one-time uh, revenue and, and, and spent in accordance with our, our fiscal policies 
um, which says one-time revenue should be used on, on one-time expenditures. On March 16th, the Executive Branch staff provided um, a FEMA reimbursement update, which we've included at circles one through three in the staff report. And in summary, to date, the county has submitted $64.9 million in FEMA reimbursement um, expenditures to the federal government. Of that amount, the county has received $54.5 million, and this does include uh, a very recent um, reimbursement award of $14.6 million um, that, has, uh, that we just received in FY23. Um, and then $10.4 million has been obligated by FEMA and is awaiting, uh, the county is awaiting payment from the state um, for, those, uh, for those amounts. And the county has about $91.5 million in potential reimbursement submissions that the executive branch team um, is, is still working through. Uh, $38.9 million is in various stages of the FEMA pre-approval process. And 52.6, which is an adjustment to the number in your packet, um, is currently under review and documentation for uh, potential submittal. Uh, so, Mr. President, would you like to stop there and ask any questions on FEMA reimbursement? Uh, I think we will. I think that's a, a good way to frame the conversation. Um, Council Member, Council Vice President Friedson. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, first of all, you know, there's two parts of this conversation. One is about ARPA and the other is about FEMA. So I'll start uh, just quickly with uh, ARPA. Uh, the, uh, I appreciate the proposal uh, to reallocate funds uh, of ARPA for two of the underutilized line items in the hotel assistance and the business rental assistance. So we're, we're just going to go through all the ARPA stuff. We're just going to do ARPA. I was just going to do. Uh, I mean, we're just going to do ARPA after. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. I'll hold off on, on that then. Uh, okay. I will speak to FEMA though. Um, I went in the opposite order. Um, so, a couple questions on the FEMA reimbursements. Obviously, I don't want to relitigate the issues that I have raised previously about the fact that I thought that the projections were wholly unrealistic, which it turned out that they uh, were. I don't think we need to relitigate that. I am glad that we're no longer using this as a budgeted resource. I very much had severe reservations about us doing that previously, and I'm glad we got out of that practice. I hope that we never go back to that practice again because I don't think that it's an appropriate way to fund a budget. Uh, and so I'm glad that we uh, changed that. I also think it's important uh, on the uh, adjusted governmental resource, I think it's important to note uh, that we did not include that uh, and, and, and have not included that uh, in the adjusted uh, governmental resources when it comes to uh, the reserves, and I think you know there's a disconnect there, and I'm glad that we're you know we've re rebalanced that. Uh, related to the FEMA reimbursements, do we have a total accounting for the amount of FEMA reimbursements that we have essentially written off that we thought we were going to get, know that we're not going to get, aren't going to pursue any longer? I don't think we have a total accounting on because we're still obviously working through eligibility with stuff that has been accrued over time. We could probably give you, a, I mean, I don't know if we have in front of you, we could give you a projection up to like yeah, I maybe 21 or something like that. But I appreciate you know, that. I, there's three categories. There's the category of what we've requested that we feel confident about that we haven't gotten back yet. There's the amount that we've requested that we're not certain of whether or not we're going to get back. We're awaiting to hear from FEMA whether or not it's reimbursable. And then there's a category that we've requested that we know we're not going to get, uh, you know, that we know we're not going to get back and so th I think really understanding those categories so we can have an understanding of wh exactly what these numbers are I think is important yeah it's a really complicated so let me explain a few things though and I think you, you may be aware of some of this but uh, some of your colleagues who have not been as uh, have not been through several of these sessions might not be um, one of the so we asked basically people to anything that they thought was female eligible we asked them to put it in this one code they poured all those numbers in there and we reconciled on the back end. And so at various times we reported like what is in this cost code related to a FEMA potential expenditure. But as we go through those before submission to FEMA and then through various iterations of a pre-approval process with FEMA, things get removed either because perhaps they were actually already billed to the CRF or ARPA and they were thrown into a duplicated bucket or they were ne never eligible in the first place and people were just over over uh, speculating about what might be eligible. And then there are things that are deemed ineligible by uh, FEMA through either various iterations of policy change that have come through both the Trump administration and the Biden administration. And so we've lost, you know, you, you start with 
you know, $50 million in the bucket and maybe whittled down to 15 or $20 million by the time of final submission. And so in answering your question, did we lose $30 million or did, was that $30 million, some of it never eligible, some of it was spent on CRF, and some of it was deemed ineligible by, by uh, FEMA? All three of those things. So it's tough to say, is that $30 million real in the sense that, you know, some of it was never eligible in the first place. We just... Uh, departments misidentified. Yeah, That's and I, I appreciate that. I don't want to relitigate the mistakes that were made previously. We, this was a very challenging time. We were making decisions. The rules were changing at the federal level. Assumptions were made. I think they were too aggressive, and I raised those issues and concerns at the time. But that's done. We're 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 we're, we're finished there. But I think now we have to get to the point where we can accept the fact that certain money is never going to be approved and we're not pursuing any longer and we just write that off just say you know we thought at one point we're going to write that off completely then there's a category that we think we still might be eligible for that we're awaiting and there's that we're confident on and i i it's not clear to me when i look at the chart the difference you know like high level of confidence we're going to get this we just don't know exactly when medium level of confidence and no confidence at all and so we're going to write that off because at this point we don't need to even still be talking about the money. You know, for instance, for differential pay, there was a period of time where we thought 75% of that, then we thought you know, virtually all of that. Now we realize basically none of that, I think 4.4 .4 million, if I recall, uh, of, of the differential pay was ultimately covered. We can write that off. We're not going to go back and try to get 90 plus million dollars reimbursed from FEMA from differential pay. We, we realized we, we didn't have the accounting to do that, the rules were changing. You know, challenging situation, but we we can move on. I think we need the accounting of that for the council to be well briefed in real time of what's coming in and what isn't. But so, if you could look into that and come back to us, I think that would be helpful. Um, when things were not going as well as we would have liked, we're taking far too long. The rules were changing. We hired a consultant. Do we still have a consultant on board? Are we still paying a consultant to help us with the yes. reimbursements? Yes, we've actually increased the the, the utilization of that uh, of that uh, provider as well. And that's Widow Brian. And are they being paid based on the amount they receive? Is it a contingency contract where it, it's, they get paid by the amount of money they take a piece of what the FEMA reimbursement is, or are they getting paid by hours, or how are they getting? It's, paid? it's an hourly, but their time itself is reimbursable. Meaning that's you get a five percent M and A, and so their their contract will actually be submitted, uh, is being submitted for for reimbursement itself. Is it reimbursed at one hundred percent or seventy five percent? Yes, it's it's a hundred percent all the way up to the deadline of June thirtieth of twenty twenty two, and then but you get five percent M and A on top of the any award that you get, which would cover their contract anyway. Okay, so we're going to get the full consultant and then but we're forward funding that so like we're yes. paying them now yes and then the goal is eventually at some point we'll get paid back yes do we have a sense of how long it will take to get paid back on the consultant for instance but also on all the other outstanding requests so it, it is very depending on what the nature of the submission has been so obviously the 14.6 million is probably our best example of something that happened faster than normal because it's a one item purchase and they they process it relatively quickly it's it's a more straightforward submission uh, but obviously the consultant will be with us through you know i just to give a sense of update on the timeline we're being told uh on background but i think it's pretty pretty we have a pretty good confidence that uh, fema is going to close out the submission portal uh, for new submissions around november of this year and then the final closeout for all submissions related to COVID-19 will be in May of 2024. And so obviously we'll probably have a consultant on board with us probably for the next year or so, just because we've been so successful with them at, you know, getting our, getting our submissions to the point where FEMA has accepted them. So um, I, I don't think there's any question that the investment that we've made to, to the, to the, to the expertise of this consultant has been well worth it in terms of getting us tens of millions of dollars. And obviously those costs themselves are reimbursable. So we, we actually feel uh, very good that uh, uh, the product, work product they've been providing us to do this. Is that budgeted for in the FY24 recommended operating budget? Is there a line item that I could identify? 
I, that would show us what we're paying the projected payment for the consultant, or is it coming out of a, another budget that? Could it's coming out of the Office of Emergency Management Homeland Security's budget, but I, I, will, I will defer. I will have to. I'll have to go back and look at how that appears in the budget for you. All right. Well, it's important. I mean, we yeah. budget in years, yeah. you know, in, in fiscal years, so it sounds like it's going to get reimbursed, which is good, but it's probably not going to get reimbursed. It's certainly not going to get reimbursed this fiscal year. It's probably not going to get reimbursed by the end of next fiscal year, or probably be the fiscal year after that. It sounds like if you know the final closeout, you know, is not going to happen until you know midway or longer through through this fiscal year. So it would be helpful to have an accounting for yeah, so the amount of money that we paid thus far and what we project to pay through the end of the engagement, which would sounds like would be somewhere in the middle of fiscal year twenty four. So if that could be shared with us when you have that, I think that would be helpful. I would also say, and I'll, I'll defer over to Mr. Hodson, I believe we're actually not waiting until the end to submit the cost for the the, the uh, consultant. We've actually begun the process of putting in for the time that they've already provided to us, and then we'll do a second submission that covers the back half of, of their of their commitment time. So, Okay. Uh, I appreciate that. If you yeah. could get that, that information to us, I would be grateful with that. I'll yield back to you. I have some questions on ARPA, but I'll wait till that appropriate time, which I didn't originally, so I apologize for that. Very good. Uh, Council Member Balcom. At times like these, I like to remind people that I'm, I am an accountant. That said, I don't know if my question has just been answered, so <laughs> please bear with me. Um, so the $91.5 in potential reimbursements, um, is that is that budgeted to be spent, or is that just we're waiting to see if we get it before we spend it? It's money that's already been spent, and we're assessing how much of it we're going to get back that we can utilize for future costs. So it's already accounted for in the budget, meaning it's money out the door that we're not counting on getting back, but we fully expect there's going to be an additional, I'm not going no. to say 90, but. No, I meant, I'm, I'm sorry, um, we spent the money, are we, are we assuming that we are getting that reimbursement? No, that's what I think we alluded okay. to. That's not reflected in the, that okay. was something we, we initially did. And as uh, Council Vice President Friedson, we learned a lesson about doing that right. and have not done that in subsequent, in FY23 or in FY24's budget. So you don't have an accounts receivable hanging out there anymore? No, we okay. don't. And then just, just to clarify, um, the eligible expenses that that window closed on uh, six twenty two, so. No, so the what closed is essentially cost before before June thirtieth of of twenty two, uh, basically should have closed at the end of the year. We got a thirty we got a ninety day extension in Montgomery County, so we have until the end of March. And so you'll see in the packet there are a number of submissions that are going to go in before March thirty first that reflect that extension period. That that total is nearly fifty million dollars itself. That is imminently going to go into the portal for the county. Uh, and then there are costs incurred after July 1 of 22 till today. The port the PIVA submission portal will stay open for those costs that we will continue to submit. So obviously we've continued to give out test kits, we've continued to give out masks, we've continued to do uh, testing and vaccination efforts all through this current uh, fiscal year. And those costs will also be reimbursable at a 75% rate for those occurring after July 1 of last year. Which is why we, we can continue to use the consultant. Exactly. Yep. Okay. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Those are all the questions right now. So if we want to proceed with the presentation. Sounds good. So now we will turn on to the ARPA part of this discussion on uh, starting on page two of the staff report. I think as most folks are aware, the county received $204.1 million in ARPA funding um, from the federal government, received in, in two tranches. Uh, jurisdictions have until December 31st, 2024 to obligate ARPA funds and until December 31st, 2026 to spend them. Um, to date, the council has appropriated $193.1 million in its ARPA funds and has set aside but not yet appropriated about $10.95 million for specific uses. In February 2023, as requested by the Council during its December fiscal update, uh, OMB did provide a status update on the, um, on the ARPA appropriations that have been made to date. And that, um, that update is included at circle four of the packet. And on table one um, on, on the next page or on page three of the staff report, I've kind of done a summary of the different ARPA expenditures, appropriations and broken them down into category. Um, one grouping of appropriations that have been fully expended. Um, a second grouping of appropriations that still have uh, funding remaining, but they're anticipated to be fully expended by the, uh, by the departments in either FY23 or FY24. 
There's a smaller set of appropriations with projected unspent funds, which I'll we'll talk about in a minute. And then there's two, um, two categories of, of funding that were previously set aside by the council, and we'll also talk about those. So in terms of the, the projected unspent funds, um, OMB does project that there will be about $1.4 million in unspent funds uh, from prior appropriations, excluding the Working Families Income Supplement, which I'll, which I'll come back to in a second. Um, these are primarily due to two appropriations. One is the hotel assistance uh, appropriation, where there's $952,000 in projected unspent funds, and also the business rental assistance, which has $340,000 in projected unspent funds. Uh, the rationale or reasoning that the hotel assistance is projected to be unspent um, is that from, from executive staff is that multiple hotels who had previously received grants had recovered financially or were bringing in revenue to the point where they no longer met the criteria for the grant. And there was also a couple that had declined the grant awards. In terms of the business rental assistance program, uh, the, the business center did conduct um, uh, outreach to different uh, groups to provide and make sure folks were aware of this program. And the unspent funds likely reflects that businesses were less impacted due to COVID than originally perceived, or that the program parameters, um, which uh, were intended to focus on the businesses most in need, um, will create a situation where the, there was restricted eligibility, so then not everyone, all the universe of businesses could receive them. Um, so those are the rationale for why those two are projected to be um, unspent as, as of this date. In terms of the Working Families Income Supplement, the Council appropriated $50 million in ARPA funds to support the expansion uh, of this supplement to kind of match the state's expansion, uh, $25 million each in FY22 and FY23. The FY22 appropriation was underspent by about $3.173 million, but the FY23 appropriation is expected to be overspent by about $4.473 million. Even though these dollars were appropriated for the same purpose, the executive branch cannot use the unspent FY22 dollars towards the FY23 um, overspending or gap um, unless authorized by the council. On March 15th, the executive did transmit a supplemental appropriation request um, along with the operating budget to, uh, to fund the additional $4.4 in FY23 um, expenditures with remaining ARPA funds, the $3.1 million that were unspent in FY22 and the $1.3 million unspent from the other ARPA funded appropriations. This, that decision is not before you today. That supplemental has to be introduced and we'll go through the, the, the council process, but I wanted to make sure folks were aware that that recommendation um, did come over um, from the executive. If the council did end up supporting that recommendation, it would use up all of the projected unspent funds from the, the hotel and the business assistance programs that I, I mentioned previously. So the last two parameters I wanted to talk about were the two uh, funding buckets that were previously set aside by the council. So for affordable housing, um, the council had set aside $4.5 million as part of the April 19th, 22 discussion, um, where the council decided on some, some ARPA spending priorities and options. Uh, since that time, there's been discussions on how best to use that, that funding for um, the, per the original purpose intended. And on March 2nd, um, six council members put forth a proposal to, to utilize this funding, um, $3 million to provide uh, funding for down payment assistance and $1.5 million in funding for the Design for Life program that provides accessibility upgrades for low income seniors and individuals with differing abilities. Um, council staff has worked with the executive branch staff to make sure that these proposals um, meet ARPA eligibility criteria and, and, and they do. And so, um, and so now the next step would be for the council to take these up as special appropriations if that's what you so choose to do. Um, and then the very last bucket was $6.45 million that was set aside for food security. And originally this was done when there was a food security appropriation and um, two things were in place. One, the, the President Biden had just extended the FEMA reimbursement deadline, so there was a desire to spend general fund dollars first. Um, and hopefully be able to submit these for FEMA reimbursement and so therefore to maximize the, the amount of federal money we would get. Because um, if you spend ARPA money on this first, then you can't get reimbursed for it. And also at the same time, um, the county was in a position where we were unsure where FY22 and 23 revenues were gonna come in. And so wanted to make sure that if general fund dollars were spent on something, um, we had to back up in case we had a, um, revenues did not come in as projected. Of course, they have come in um, over projection for, for 22 and 23 to put the county in a, in a better financial position. 
Um, so at this point, and given that the uh, the federal the FEMA reimbursement eligibility is ending um, soon, as, as Dr. Stoddard and, and the team mentioned, um, staff suggests that the council. Um, again, consider appropriating these remaining funds as part of your FY24 budget deliberations, either for the food security um, expenditures as originally envisioned, or if there's a different ar other ARPA eligible expenditure that the council chooses to, to use this money for, that's an option as well. And so with that, I will turn it back over to you. Thank you, Mr. Howard. Uh, a lot to unpack in that presentation, uh, and that is uh, recognized by my colleagues uh, who, uh, who have requested to speak and so uh, cognizant of that let me let me just try and frame this in, in, in a way suitable for for a conversation we received nearly 204 million dollars in the federal government uh, from the federal government and over the last two to three years we now have just shy of 11 million dollars that is unspent 10 million nine hundred fifty thousand dollars is that correct that is unappropriated. That is unappropriated. Yes. Um, and you mentioned some programs uh, or some items that colleagues uh, have already uh, put in requests for or have expressed interest in using those funds for. Is that correct? Yeah, that was for the, the dollars that the council had previously set aside for a specific purpose. and but there hadn't been an appropriation yet for that purpose and so just recently there was um, a proposal to use those dollars for that for that purpose i'm familiar with the proposal uh that six of my colleagues put forward just again want to help frame the conversation so that we 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 all un understand it dr stoddard as council staff has recommended that these unspent funds be used in the F for the FY24 budget um, in the areas in which we have expressed critical need. To take a step back, and I think this is a, a tricky conversation to get too much into the FY24 budget, which was uh, shared with us less than one week ago, uh, but considerable uh, relationship between these funds, um, the nearly uh, 195 million dollars which have been used over the last two years um, there are a lot of programs that we use those funds are that are continuing in this fy24 budget that are outside of the scope of what has been identified can you share the uh, executives uh, thoughts and omb's thoughts if you can speak for them but definitely the administration um, in the allocation of these resources and the continuation of programs that we knew were going to be limited by the amount of federal funds we were receiving. Yeah, I can speak in part to that. I think I'll, I'll defer to some of my colleagues at OMB who, who may have chimed in on the OMB's perspective. So um, we learned a lot about uh, communities' needs during the pandemic, and I think that that was reflected in a lot of the programs that the council approved and, and, and a lot of programs the executive branch asked for and, uh, and got approval from the council to use funds for. Um, food, uh, food Security Task Force is probably the most, uh, I don't want to say significant because I think we did a lot with affordable housing as well, but it's just sort of an example of a new program that we had not really done before where we identified a significant need. That need is not abated, if anything, with the SNAP enrollment uh, decreases we've seen over the last couple of months, the need has, has expanded in some cases. And so there are certain areas where the executive believes that we cannot go back to the way we were doing business prior to the pandemic. and. I think there has been, a, yeah, I, certainly in conversations with many of the council, I, I believe that that's probably reflective of, of, of general feeling in certain, in many areas, uh, food probably being a really key example, but certainly there are others. And so the utilization of the remaining 10.9, obviously we, we at the executive branch have been, um, we've made some, you know, we made a lot of recommendations with regard to the 195 million, but obviously the council had made clear that it intended to utilize the remaining 10.9 for programs that it believed were important to close out. and so. I certainly think there are several areas of the FY24 budget that would be appropriate utilization places for the remaining funds that are that are you know, continuations of the projects that we had uh, all agreed were important prior to or during the pandemic response. Um, but I, I do believe in certain areas, food being a very obvious example that I'm most familiar with, there is no intention to change the the 
the delivery of those services moving forward from the executive's perspective. He believes that every time we try and modify those programs, he is a very vocal advocate for making sure that we continue to keep people fed, even as we modify and, and try and address food resiliency, address underlying hunger, modify the programs to address, be more sustainable. But the, the, there is a strong inclination that we do need to continue to do some of the things that we learned during the pandemic were real, real needs. I appreciate you sharing those thoughts. I've already been receiving uh, communication in multiple ways from folks who are um, extremely concerned about their uh, drop in uh, decrease in SNAP benefits. Uh, and what we are doing to, to support food food resiliency. Uh, and so I, I, I do understand that. And uh, this clearly, I don't want to get ahead of the budget conversations that will ensue, but this is all part of the same conversation about the $204 million that we have used to keep our residents healthy and safe and how we will continue keep keeping them healthy and safe, knowing that there is $10,950,000 remaining. This is a tough conversation, and this is a tough conversation that we're going to continue over the next two months as we go through this budget, uh, but this conversation helps set the stage. With that, I'll turn it over to Councilmember Albert Uh Thank you, Mr. President. And I, I just want to thank the team. I know that, um, as Council Vice President Friedson noted, this was unprecedented, and the way we were able to work with our federal partners to get dollars out in the community where they were the most needed at the time was truly extraordinary. And when you compare our jurisdiction to others, we fared very well, um, both in terms of reimbursement, but also in terms of the ask. And in fact, we're used as a model by the federal government and the Biden administration for other jurisdictions. And so while it was painful to go through that process, and Council Vice President Friedson in particular did an important job in asking the right questions to make sure that we were all being held accountable, um, I just ultimately, I think this is um, overall, uh, I think, a success story. Um, I did have a couple of questions, though, and, and, and they're not specific to us, um, but a number of our partners, um, Montgomery County Public Schools received a great deal of funds from our federal government as well, so did Montgomery College. And while I'm appreciative of the standards that we have set forward within county government, I'm just curious as to um, as a follow-up, maybe uh, getting a similar report on how these funds were spent by starting with sister county agencies, and then I have a follow-up thought or comment. But yeah, most certainly we will do that as part of the budget. You know, um, information that we provide for both MCPS and Montgomery College, who received significant you know uh, influxes of, of federal ARPA dollars through different different buckets than the the two hundred four million that dollars that the the, the county government received, um, and. And we can we can make sure that that's you know included in the discussion and the information council members receive. That'd be great. And then by extension, a number of our key partners, such as our hospitals, um, also received a great deal of support as well, which served as a bridge and got us through these very difficult times. But those funds have obviously been spent as well, which has implications for us uh, and our overall public health infrastructure. So it would be good to get a report, um, particularly from some of the healthcare industries who most benefited from some of the federal funds to see where they are because you know there have been organic conversations we've all been having them um, that the needs there have continued have not subsided but the federal funds are spent and so what does that mean for those budgets what does that mean for the county support of those organizations is a conversation that we're going to have to have both through the budget process clearly um, but beyond that as well and I'm also um, you know, there's still a lot of federal funds that are out there. Um, and so I know that we've recently entered into an agreement with um, an organization that will help us identify some of those resources that are outside of FEMA and ARPA reimbursement, but in other areas, um, because I, I do think that there's uh, an opportunity for us to better leverage the resources we have here and take some of the lessons learned from the last couple of years and apply them to other partnerships with our federal partners as well. Uh, so I yield back to you, Mr. President, but Appreciate all the hard work. Thank you, Councilmember Stewart. Thank you. Uh, I want to add my thanks um, to everyone on this work. Um, you know, doing this as we were going through COVID, figuring out the FEMA and the ARPA was a, a very difficult time, and I appreciate all the hard work that went into that. Um, I just I have received a question um, regarding the arts and humanities um, council. Um, 
uh, appropriate money. And I know, Mr. Howard, that's in the top part where it, it said all those appropriations have been fully expended. And I just wanted to double check because I received a question yesterday about was that actually, did that actually happen? <laughs> um, so just wanted to ask that. I believe that is the case, and that's the information that we've received from OMB. But we will we will double check on that and uh, and make sure that um, Arts and Humanities um, Council helped uh, distribute funds for in two different pots. The, they received some money that the council appropriated from the CARES Act, mm -hmm. the CRF, um, as well as the the ARPA funding. Um, but we will double check to make sure that they have been expended as as is shown on the chart. Great, thank you so much. I yield back. Thank you, Council Vice President Friesen. Thank you at the appropriate time to ask questions of ARPA. I appreciate it. Uh, I'll echo colleagues. I really do appreciate it. Obviously, these were very, very difficult situations that we were in trying to figure out how to make these decisions and how to prioritize funding and how to balance filling the gap of our budget and funding emergency expenses and helping residents and businesses get through an unprecedented time because it wasn't just county government that was trying to get through a crisis. It was each and every one of our residents and each and every one of our businesses uh, as well. Uh, nothing is perfect, uh, but we have managed uh, better than most, uh, which I think is important. Uh, and so I, I uh, will uh, echo that uh, sentiment as well. Um, just a couple points here on, on ARPA. Um, uh, number one, um, I absolutely fully support uh, Working Families Supplement. I'm glad that we stepped up and matched the state. I'm glad that we are, I think, the only jurisdiction uh, in the state that, that does it to the extent that, that we have done. The Working Families uh, Income su Supplement is you know, perhaps the, the most effective, most proven poverty fighting tool that we have uh, in the state of Maryland uh, and, and, and certainly uh, that the county can play a significant role in. Uh, and so I, I really think that that was a good use of funds. I advocated to set aside the additional year, the extra 25 million. So we used 50 million, 25 one year, 25 million uh, the next year. I think it's absolutely appropriate, even though we need to take action in order to allow this, to use the underage from one year for the overage of another year for the same commitment uh, that we made for this critical program. So absolutely supportive of that. Uh, I am a little concerned, and I think we absolutely need to fully fund the Working Families Income Supplement. Uh, but in moving the funding from the hotel assistance and the business rental assistance program uh, and moving it to an unrelated priority. I think that's something that we really need to think through and decide whether or not uh, we should be reallocating those funds uh, to the businesses that we committed them to uh, in making sure that they're being utilized in a way that they're needed at a time when they're needed uh, and you know whether that is the most appropriate and effective source for those funds, acknowledging we all are committed, the executive and the council, uh, to fully funding the Working Families Income Supplements. I just wanted to note that I think that is a question that we need to discuss as a council, as a, a policy matter of whether or not we're going to change the, uh, the use of those funds to a completely unrelated uh, area, and because I think that, that does have implications in terms of the commitments that we make. Uh, to various uh, communities. So I just wanted to note that for colleagues. Uh, on the food aspect, I just wanted to propose and, and, and raise and, and something to consider. There has been a longstanding conversation uh, that has included the Climate Action Plan Coalition, the General Assembly with an annual report from the Maryland Food System Resiliency Council about an aggregation facility, uh, four of which have been proposed at the state level. Uh, we have set aside $6.45 million in food resiliency. Uh, and I'm wondering if, um, you know, I know that originally that was contemplated specifically for emergency food assistance, which is critical and we absolutely need to fund, uh, but whether or not this would be an opportunity to make it what could be a transformational investment in the future uh, with a one-time expense to do a feasibility study or to move forward the uh, potential for an aggregation facility which would help us to uh, address food resiliency and, and food security uh, and uh, is, you know, I think directly related to the commitment that we made. So I wanted to just put that out there. Obviously, we're not making formal decisions on, on some of these funds and just wanted to ask uh, if 
that would be an eligible expense uh, for uh, ARPA if we put it towards moving a proposal forward. Obviously, 6.45 million in and of itself is not going to fund an aggregation facility in and of itself, but you know the, the pre-planning and the feasibility uh, and other aspects uh, of a proposal like that, you know, is that something that you know ARPA money could be used for? I'll let Dr. Stoddard comment in a minute, but I would just say we'd have to look into it, um, which is generally my answer for any ARPA expenditure question because the um, the the rules yeah. are very long and complex. And that's totally and, fine. Yeah. So I just asked that staff look into that and just raise for colleagues. Uh, there could be an opportunity here to make a long-term transformational investment uh, that uh, doesn't you know necessarily obligate us to year in and year out ongoing expenses. And so I just wanted to uh, put that marker down. I'll just close uh, appreciating uh, colleagues. We had set aside the four and a half million dollars for affordable housing. Uh, the uh, colleagues have uh, put forward an approach. This money is already set aside. It's already specifically uh, intended uh, to support affordable housing programs. Uh, we have confirmed uh, that uh, the uh, proposal for the four and a half million related to the affordable housing that it is set aside for would be an appropriate uh, use. Uh, and I would just note it does not necessarily have to wait till fiscal year 24. The uh, home ownership program in particular is expended halfway through the year. We just got an update uh, on that. And so this would be an example uh, of an ARPA use and an ARPA fund that we've already committed to at a high level that this specify specifically how we could move it forward uh, and we're able to get this money out the door into the hands of those who desperately need it particularly uh, in this case vulnerable homeowners uh, and first-time homeowners uh, three million would go to the first-time homeowner program under this proposal one and a half million would go to the design for life program which assists uh, moderate and low-income homeowners who are at risk of losing their homes or who cannot upkeep the maintenance in their homes or the uh, accessibility in their homes. And so appreciate colleagues uh, for moving that forward uh, together and hope the full council can take that up uh, in the near future. So uh, thanks, and with that, I will yield back to you with appreciation. Thank you, Councilmember Jawando. Thank you. Uh, well, first, thank you, President Biden and, and um, <laughs> members, me Democratic members of Congress. <laughs> Uh, and the few the others that supported, I mean, this. I think this is a largely, to Councilmember Albanaz's point, this is a success story. I mean, we would, the pain that our communities would have gone through without this nearly $200 million, obviously, we're talk, and, and more, uh, and with other programs, uh, you know, I was so thankful to, as we started meeting online, to be able to be in a position to allocate these resources. And I want to thank the county executive's team uh, for uh, all the, there were some bumps in the road for sure, but for getting this money out in, in, a, in a way that has helped hundreds of thousands of residents. Um, the, I did have a couple specific questions. The, obviously the business rental assistance was, that was a proposal I put forward and I appreciate colleagues if it was first a million dollars and, and we got that out pretty quickly. And then my understanding with the second million, because we came back, there were people who didn't get approved in the first round uh, and there were a lot of applications that didn't get approved and my understanding I was a little surprised to see this is that we went back to those businesses and then they were asked to apply and some of that money was allocated it looks like that's what happened so I just wanted to know uh, council vice president Friedson alluded to this you know there was a specific purpose for this I wanted to know what happened um, and you know th there were in my recollection enough other businesses to fill out the rest of the money that it applied in the first round. So could, could, does anyone up here know exactly why, what, what the circumstances were that we weren't able to get it out the door? Yeah, I, I spoke to uh, Mr. Weissman, obviously you know, the Business Advancement Center, and, and uh, he said we'd send over some additional, like, some additional clarification on this, but the, lar the overarching uh, point was we did not have enough applications at the end to give out the dollars that, that there was a lack, there was a, I shouldn't say a lack of interest, but the people who met the criteria, there were not enough of them during the second round to fill out the full award. All right, well, I want to dig into that, and, and as we're, before we decide how to reallocate it, you know, one of the things we did, we targeted it, you had to be f half a million or less in business a year, because we wanted to get the, the really small, we had done a lot of business assistance, which was needed, 
but there were a lot of people who had been missed. And so if we needed to put that up a little bit or so, I, I think it should go to that purpose. There's still businesses trying to dig out. And, and if you ask a small business today what their number one cost is, they're going to retail business, they're going to tell you it's their, their rent, their lease. So um, I would like to, before we move it anywhere, find out really what happened and and if some adjustments like I said in the eligibility criteria moving that up to say a million dollars or something could still provide some assistance to some businesses so I, I just would ask that we follow up on that count uh, to both council staff and the administration um, obviously working families income supplement so important so uh, I, I, as other colleagues have said we have a, a strong commitment to that and we're unique in our how we match that here and, and what we do. Um, the, the, the other question uh, related to uh, hotels, I would just say the same thing. We should have a similar analysis um, and, uh, and just look, in, look into that. Obviously, we're happy that people are traveling again and staying in hotels, so that's a good thing, but I think we should just look at that in context as well. And then the final thing I'll say on the, you know, I remember we put aside this, this 10 million or so um, for affordable housing and food security, kind of set it aside. And I think we'll have a robust debate, not today, but a discussion about how we spend that. Um, would be also curious to hear uh, from the administration that, you know, in partnership and, and thoughts there. But uh, as we head into this budget, I know there are discussions that have been mentioned about people being concerned about on the food security side as well, that certain places were funded again or what the levels are and what the what the needs are so we should we, I think we should just have that in the context of this as well understanding this is one-time funding so uh, appreciate the work on this and look forward to following up thank you councilmember Fani Gonzalez my questions very very similar to yours specifically on the business rental assistance so I would just add so I don't have to repeat anything here um, I'm also interested in under, um, understanding the criteria to qualify. Look, when I was running for office, I door knocked not only houses, but businesses, small businesses, and a lot of them, they have no idea how to apply for these double grants. So this is shocking to me. Uh, the need is out there, we just don't know how to ask or how to share that we have the funds. So when, what's the process here? Like, when are you coming back? to give us these answers or what's what's next so I can understand that. So what's next is that we will, based on the questions today, we'll, we'll get the follow-up information working with our executive branch partners on some of the more detailed rationale, reasoning. We'll provide everyone, make sure everyone has the criteria that were used um, for the different grant programs, um, as well as provide follow-up information on related to if some of the criteria were changed, would that make more you know, of the applicants eligible and things like that. The council, you know, it, it's up to you when you would want to make a decision on how to utilize or not utilize well, um, these utilize additional the additional funds. That, yes, obviously, you'll use utilize it, but in what way? Um, yeah. So just because the executive recommended using this for the working families income supplement, you know, it's up to the council to, to make that final and, call. And, and let me ask you, let's say that you come back here, let's just say May, just for the sake of saying one month. This three hundred and forty thousand dollars that are unspent funds for the business rental assistance, is there a time frame when when you had to spend let's say and we update the criteria? Is there a time frame when we need to spend this money? The money can be spent until December thirty first, twenty twenty six. Twenty twenty six. So oh, okay. the timing is not as much of an issue I with see. these ARPA funds. It's just making sure that the programs and, and such are set up in a way that the money can be spent in the way that you want it to be spent. Got it. And uh, we're also going to have a, a session in the Economic Development Committee just on small businesses, so we might touch on this after the budget is dealt with, obviously. Uh, and then the last thing I will say, just because why not, I will echo everything that Council Vice President Andrew Fritzen said about the affordable housing um, request that the six of us made. Uh, I think it's a great idea, and I look forward to full support. That's all. Thank you, Councilmember Balcom. Thank you. Um, not to pile on the, the business rental assistance, but um, so I worked on that uh, grant, and it, it, it was trying to give, trying to get applications, trying to get eligible applications. 
it was very narrowly defined, um, and we had a hard time finding people who fit that eligibility criteria. And we 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 talked with the administration to say it's the it's the the definition of who was eligible was uh, was tiny. However, I am surprised that we didn't spend all the money because um, I know that there's need out there. I guarantee there's need out there, even within that uh, very narrow band. But I wanted to talk uh, primarily about the lessons learned. So throughout the, throughout the um, assistant, business assistance uh, process, we knew that we weren't reaching all the businesses. In fact, we were only reaching a tiny sliver of businesses, and and that I think that was a big lesson learned for how the county uh, has access to businesses. So I don't want to lose that, um, and because it was something that was so stark, uh, businesses that got money were businesses that were engaged with formal business associations, chambers, other uh, trade associations, which meant that the majority of businesses didn't even know that there was money out there. So I just don't want to lose that point. Um, and this is a perfect example of, of that happening. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, share that. Um, I'm intrigued by Council Member Friedson's uh, suggestion about the uh, aggregate, uh, aggregation center. I think that's a great idea to look at whether that, that that's a possibility. Uh, another lesson learned was the resiliency of our food so food source and food security. And I think that uh, having this aggregation center would be great. Particularly, we just celebrated uh, Agriculture Day today, and we had a lot of uh, small farmers, table food farmers. And uh, I think this would be uh, such a great economic support for our very small farmers. So I um, just want to echo that. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Mink. Thank you. Thanks for all the thoughtful commentary from everyone and for all your uh, hard work on this. Um, a couple questions. Um, how much, uh, Dr. Sutter, of the ARPR funds were used for the service hubs? Do you know offhand? Um, and would it be inappropriate? use of, or staff, what would be an appropriate use of resources to uh, use a small amount of that to ensure that current hub access continues if needed? I don't have the numbers off okay. the top of my head, but I will say I believe the council last year utilized funds to maintain the operations of at least one hub. Uh, that was a decision the council made last year to do. Thank you. Yeah, and there was also um, some of the hubs were initially funded with the uh, CRF dollars um, first, and then then were funded uh, with some of the ARPA dollars. So we can make sure we get the, the full amount put together for you. Okay. Um, and it, it would be an eligible expenditure for. It would be an an eligible. Correct. Great. It would be eligible for okay. future uses. <laughs> <laughs> All right, perfect. Yes, just want to make sure. Yeah, the hubs have been so critical and such a huge part of our success story. Um, and uh, you know, we have so many community members who now have personal ties with each of those individual hubs. They're being connected to other county resources. They've got, you know, we've got case managers. So I just want to make sure that we're able to continue all of those hubs in in place. Um, I'm noticing also that we don't have ARPA funds left for um, rapid rehousing. Um, do we have funding for that budgeted elsewhere? Are there other sources for that that we're looking at? Dr. Stutter or anyone? Uh, sorry, I don't, I'm, I don't, I'm not aware. So. We'll have to get back, back okay. to that one. Yeah. All right, because that we're, I mean, we're definitely still in, in, at a point where folks are needing that big time. So uh, I think that in my eyes would be a very high priority to make sure that we are taking that into account and that we have appropriate budget for that. Thanks. Thank you. Council Member Jawando. Thank you. I just wanted uh, to colleagues, I appreciate all the interest in the small business program. Uh, LEDC uh, managed that for us and I just was with them and they s seemed to suggest that there was a lot of interest. So we'll figure that out. I mean, obviously we want to ask them because they were the, the, the person, people that helped us get to that deeper level to Councilmember Valkos, but it's still, still a big issue. Um, and just want to second what uh, Councilmember Mink said about the food, the, about the hubs. Uh, you know, it's hard to believe it's been almost three years since that that has all hap started and uh, but as you said dr. Stoddard the need is still there 
um, and I and while I'm happy that the continuation of the hub is in the budget, I think on some of these ones that maybe didn't get continued to get to that deeper level of analysis. Um, so appreciate that point. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you to my colleagues for their good comments and, and questions. And clearly, uh, we're going to be continuing this conversation as we enter into the official FY24 budget cycle. Uh, as we uh, hear more proposals uh, and they're uh, more officially put forward regarding the remaining funds that are left. Um, and uh, we're going to continue working to keep our residents healthy, safe, and housed. That is, uh, I know, our shared commitment in county government. The question is, how do we do that? And that is going to be the foundation or the rationale for the next few conversations that we have. Uh, so not seeing any other uh, co colleagues who want to speak, I want to thank you all for the work that you have been doing and the work that we're going to continue doing together. Oh, yes, comments? One quick follow-up. The rapid rehousing is in the HHS conversation, so we'll be going through that as part Wonderful of the 24 budget review. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Howard. Continuing our conversations on the budget, we are now, or budgets, we are now going to engage in a series of work sessions on amendments to the FY 23 to 28 Capital Improvements Program. Uh, and the first item that we are going to take up uh, is the economic development portfolio. Um, and I'll turn it over to Councilmember Fonda Gonzalez if you have any opening comments. Um, other than that, to say that I think the decision that we made this morning on hiring or, or allowing the county executive to have that uh, special assistant on this very issue is a good thing, and we look forward to working with that person once it's found. Um, and and really making sure that um, that on the um, on the digital uh, digital um, work we're actually closing the gap, but I'm sure the staff can say more if there is need to. Mr. Mayor, um, I'm sorry. Are we talking on about the CAP or? On the digital equity, is that the one? Uh, well, we're talking the CIP. Yes. Oh, you wanted us to be. I'm sorry. No, um, no uh, yeah, that one was your schedule. Yes, um, yes. No, <laughs> anything that you guys want out the White Oak signs get away? Do you want to? No, uh, just to note that the committee recommended concurred with the staff's no. and county executive's recommendation on that on the White Oak project, as well as the technical adjustments for the White Flint project. I'll just note that the CE did send over some March amendments on the White Oak project that the committee has not yet reviewed. We will schedule that during the upcoming budget discussions. And that staff is also working with the uh, developer to schedule a briefing probably in June or July uh, to come back and provide more detail on that project. So. Yeah, I spoke to a developer and he's on board and he's ready to come soon. Uh, he has good news to share. That's what I can say. <laughs> Anybody else have any comments on this particular item? Not seeing any. Uh, we will uh, support the committee's work uh, without objection. Uh, next item, a few are being postponed. So the next item is uh, county offices and other improvements. Mm -hmm. I'll turn it over to the GEO Chair, Ms. Stewart. Great. Thanks. Um, so the GO Committee reviewed um, all the items that you have in your packet on February 16th. There are a handful of projects, as noted in the packet, that um, we already reviewed and already um, came for a council vote. Um, one of the things that we did vote on, the committee voted 3-0 to recommend approval of the executive's recommended amend amendments for select DGS administered projects in the general government, um, county offices, and other Im improvements. Um, and the committee recommendation are all in line with the council staff's recommendation for all projects. Um, I just want to um, thank the, uh, the, the staff for this, Director Dice, thank you so much. Um, and I will note for colleagues that Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee had a very robust conversation regarding um, the possible creation in the future of an equipment reserve fund um, and the fact that the, at the county level we actually don't have one. And those of us who come from municipal government <laughs> um, and have them at that level um, uh, really are, are strongly in favor of them. So um, I just want to thank Director Dice for um, the conversation and 
the government operations will be coming back to that topic. I yield. Mr. Mayor, anything to add? I uh, just wanted to note that, the, again, the CE did send over an additional amendment for the ADA compliance project, which we will review uh, in the upcoming budget discussions. Uh, Councilmember Jawando. Uh, I thank the GO committee for its work. I just wanted to mention the MCPS bus depot relocation, and, and it's something we all hear about a lot. Um, and uh, not more than probably Director Dyson, uh, but uh, but that uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that we're happy to hear that there's a revised scope that was actually less uh, money, but that all but does not remove the urgency of the planning and site identification, so that we can get a new solution there. So I just wanted to call that out, and really happy to. You can obviously expand on it if you'd like, but I'm glad that that moved forward as well. Thank you. Well, it's just uh, this came up in the committee discussion as well. It uh, underscores the fact that this project has not and will not go away until there's a solution. And this is evidence of the staff time that uh, we have going on, both our staff and consultants, when we're looking at different sites and feasibilities and plans and working with uh, neighboring jurisdictions as well. So uh, we're not prepared, act obviously, to go full on, but we uh, always have the engine idling. Uh, Councilmember Lutke. Thank you. And uh, yeah, we talk a lot about the bus depot in District 7. And um, and I just I want to thank the committee for recommending and the county executive for proposing to keep the $250,000 in the project so that DGS can move forward with the study and make sure this, this um, does actually happen because the people in Durwood really care and and I'm sure my colleagues sitting here know I really care and I bother you all the time about this and I'm going to continue bothering you about this with a smile but I will continue to ask about it on a regular basis and stay on top of this because I made them that promise um, this is a long time in the making and we are now in a different and changed posture with the electrification of our school bus fleet which which is great, um, and I know that we've had some really wonderful and collaborative talks about this, um, and that there are other alternatives that can at least reduce the size of a footprint of a new bus depot, um, which helps and changes the landscape of what we're evaluating um, in terms of moving forward back from when the original sector plan was modified in 2016, I think it was, maybe-ish? Something like that. It was a little before then, but yes. Before right, then, right. then there was another change. Yes. It yes. Was updated, yeah. um, so I'm I'm excited about this, and I look forward to seeing the results of the study by the end of fiscal year 24. Yeah. Just for everyone's benefit, we're working with MCPS uh, and and uh, at the solutions, including various locations and options for parking buses. And as uh, Councilmember Lukey points out, uh, the the game changer is moving from diesel to electric. Uh, and uh, this opens up a lot of opportunities that we're exploring in concert with MCPS, and we'll be meeting with them. As for your constituents in Durwood, I believe I'm on track to meet with them in the next couple months. So give them an update face to face. Will do, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, Director Dice, I just want to uh, elevate what you just said or ask you to elevate what you just said with the electrification of our MCPS bus fleet, which will be taking place over the next a number of years, decade, a little less than that, working with PEPCO and our utilities to uh, make sure we have the facilities for them. By that uh, technological advancement, we will be able to find a new place for a bus depot in the mid part of the county? It's, uh, the, the focus is really, uh, making use of opportunities in the real estate market. This is its not a question of, of, of can we, certainly we can. It's the availability of real estate to do that. And that's, uh, that's money and that's an issue that we'll, we'll continue to look at because there's a number of, not only do we have school buses to consider, but we've county ride on uh, transit buses. And there's again, a lot of very positive things taking place in there, not just the electrification, but moving to hydrogen fueled buses at our, um, at our Gaithersburg Depot. Uh, so there's a, a lot more that will be coming out over the next year as we give you details, major grant applications that we have underway that we're competing with just in the DC area, competing with many states and regions. And 
the good news is is that we continue to um, make each cut. So there's uh, funding opportunities uh, and uh, public-private partnerships that we are already pursuing. So we'll start to have more report for you within the next few months as to where that's going. Very exciting. The potential for the electrification of our MCPS bus fleet is great, yeah. and the potential for that bus depot site is even greater, if I can make up that word. Gotcha. So there we go. Greater. greater. No, that's a real word. Um, just out of context. So um, so with that, uh, no, not seeing any other speakers, uh, we will accept without objection the GEO Committee's recommendations. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next, we will go to MNCPP Parks CIP pro, uh, budget, uh, and I'll turn it over to the chair of the PHP committee. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, we had uh, before us the uh, MNCPPC CIP for uh, FY23 to 28. Uh, this uh, reflected the $276 million that was approved last May uh, in the uh, so-called on year of the CIP. Uh, we also had uh, a brief conversation uh, related to the uh, the changes that were made in November and then ratified subsequent to that uh, to uh, address the farm women's market projects on lot 24 and lot 10. Uh, that redevelopment uh, project, noting the, the state aid and intergovernmental contributions and uh, Bethesda Park uh, Im impact payments, uh, the county executive recommended uh, funding uh, at the full level, but then uh, a, re uh, a reduction of one and a half million dollars, so five hundred thousand dollars over three years uh, between fiscal year twenty six and twenty eight uh, in uh, geo bond uh, expenditures. Uh, the committee decided three nothing to reject the one and a half million dollar cut, consistent with uh, previous actions that we've taken to. Uh, reject uh, proposed cuts from the county executive uh, of the parks, noting uh, the uh, parks were relied on more than ever uh, during the pandemic and, 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 and the uh, interest and, and, and needs within the community. And so uh, uh, before us is a committee recommendation to uh, reject the one and a half million dollars in geo bond reductions and maintaining uh, at the uh, existing level. I don't know if uh, Ms. Dunn, you have anything uh, to add? Well, the only thing I'd like to um, add for the council is that um, last week, on March 15th, um, the council received another recommended reduction to the Parks CIP of another $1.5 million. Um, and Parks is in the process of evaluating that with their planning board. Um, it will then go to committee and it will come to council. But that's not part of what's in front of you today. That hadn't been received by the time this was ready to come to council. Yeah, I think it's helpful to note the council president sent requests uh, to Park and Planning and other outside agencies related to the uh, county executives uh, uh, subsequent uh, spending cuts. And so we have to take those up in committee, not before us uh, today, but thank you for uh, acknowledging. So uh, with that, Mr. President, um, we have a committee recommendation to reject the $1.5 million in geo bond funding. We'll have to address the other $1.5 million, I presume, at a uh, subsequent committee session, but I'll yield back to you. Thank you. No, I, I appreciate uh, bring, raising that point uh, and clarifying for, for colleagues and, and constituents in that uh, the work sessions for the Planning, Harks, uh, Planning Housing and Parks Committee uh, took place before the county executive uh, conveyed uh, more cuts to the relevant CIP. And so what we are doing today is uh, just signaling our support for what the committee has already done, and there will be further evaluation based on input we receive from the Park and Planning Commission, having sought their, having sought their um, uh, ideas as to what areas should be cut. And a similar notice was sent by me to Montgomery College and um, MCPS as well for those relevant cuts. Not seeing any anyone wanting to speak, we will support the committee recommendation uh, without objection. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dunn. Next is the Burtonsville Community Revitalization, which also went to the PHP Committee. Council Vice President Prudson. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. We had the Burtonsville Community Revitalization uh, CIP. The uh, committee uh, um, voted 3 nothing to uh, accept that. Uh, we can take that up uh, individually, or we can take it up as well with the Affordable Housing Acquisition and 
Preservation CIP, which we also uh, approve. But I don't know if you want to take those up as separate. Uh, uh, let's just do separate since that's okay. how we have them listed in the agenda. Uh, okay. Uh, Burtonsville Community Revitalization uh, CIP, uh, the uh, committee voted 3 nothing to accept uh, as recommended. I don't know if there's anything, uh, Mr. Mia, that you have to add or from the executive branch, but uh, we took yes. We, 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 uh, we accepted uh, as proposed by the executive. Yeah, these are both pretty straightforward technical adjustments, so no Very issues. Good. Uh, and without objection, we'll, we'll accept those. Uh, and, then, good. And, and then the, lastly, yep, go, yeah, go right Affordable ahead. housing acquisition and preservation, CIP, uh, very similar in this regard. There was a slight uh, tweak, I would say, and, and change to uh, where the funding was uh, coming from as reflected uh, in the, the CIP, a very modest uh, change uh, uh, related to uh, 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 loan repayments. Uh, and so we uh, accepted the recommendation as proposed by the county executive to maintain the level of funding, make the modest change for the funding source, and uh, approved it three to nothing. Any comments by anybody? Uh, not seeing any. These are all pretty straightforward. Uh, we will accept the committee recommendation. Um, and with that, these were the easy CIP. Uh, the hard work will be coming, um, but in between then, uh, we will have an adjournment. So uh, thank you very much, everybody, and we are adjourned.